check, check, check. Audio, audio, audio. Hey, everybody, good morning. So glad you're here at the gathering. It's 9.30. We get started right at 9.40, but if you haven't already, please make sure to get a cup of coffee, something to eat from the rear of the room. Also, we're doing a series right now that's helping you kind of build on some biblical familiarity, and it's important to have a physical copy of the Bible in your hand today. If you don't have one with you or use a phone primarily, that's quite all right. We got a whole rack in the back of the room. So if you jump up and grab a red Bible sometime in the next 10 minutes, uh, have that with you. It's going to help a lot, and we'll get started right at 9.40. Glad you're here. Check, check, check. All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the senior associate pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. This is The Gathering. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. The Gathering is two services of worship and connection and community here at the church. The first one's at 930 right in this room where you found right now. The second is at 11 o'clock. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to get something to eat and something to drink from the rear of the room. Uh, we do eat, drink coffee and eat food during the entire worship service. So if at any point you need a refill or anything like that, Please feel free to get up and help yourself. Uh, if at any point you need, kids need to stretch their legs or you just need to get up for a second, the easiest way to do so is out those doors in the rear of the room. You can go through the garden and you'll find restrooms and anything else you need in the main body of the church. I want to let you know that we're doing a special sermon series uh, right now called My Bible. Uh, basically, every sermon series here is about the Bible to one extent or the other, but we're specifically helping people walk through and engage uh, with the Bible, become more familiar with it. And if you don't have a physical copy of the Bible with you today, which most don't, that's quite all right. We have a whole rack in the back of red Bibles. In just a second, we're going to stand up and sing. Uh, if you want to sneak back there and grab a copy of the Bible, that's going to help you a lot when we get into the sermon uh, a little bit later on in the service. Before we get going, just a couple quick words of announcement. First, one of the things that's really near and dear to the heart of the gathering is partnering with our mission. Uh, the church here, First United Methodist Church, has First Street Methodist Mission, which is a mission to the homeless and the working poor here in the city of Fort Worth. One of the most important services that we provide is food bank. Uh, helping people have some nutrition support. However, there's a number of people who are part of our community who can't actually make it to the food bank when the food bank is open, uh, usually because of their work schedule or because the transportation services available in Fort Worth don't just help them get there when they need to get there. So once a month, what we'll do from the gathering is uh, sign up, go down to the mission after church, uh, go through, pack up groceries for a couple of different people, and then go and deliver them uh, to their houses, helping people who are part of our community find the nutrition support that they need. And if you and your family are interested in participating, hey, Jack, good morning. Uh, one of the things that you can do is sign up, and we'll go through the service, uh, pack it up. You've, it's a great opportunity for families to help out together, and uh, it's an opportunity to pitch in, get familiar, uh, and participate in this incredibly important work here at the church. So that's going to be next Sunday, the 22nd, that we do that. Uh, if you want, you and your families want to participate, whether this is your first time or you do it every single month, we'd love to have you. Please consider signing up and passing the sheet uh, to those who are here around you. The next announcement we have is I uh, want to invite you to participating and help make the gathering happen. Uh, we, and by the way, there's always there's some seats. We have a bunch of people in the back. There's more seats up front. Uh, newsflash, there's always seats up front. Um, it's kind of like, like SeaWorld. Everyone's afraid they're going to get called on if they sit too far, close to the front. Uh, there's always seats up here. Uh, glad that you're with us. So uh, one of the things that uh, we do is we, we, the gathering is over 300 people every Sunday now together in worship. And we make sure that every one of those 300 people has an opportunity with a seat, uh, ready for them, that has uh, the food and coffee ready for them, that they're greeted when they walk in the door, and volunteers are what makes all of that possible. And uh, one of the easiest ways for you to volunteer, to get connected, is to indicate that you want to volunteer on the back of the attendance card that's in your seat today. Uh, if, you, if you indicate that, what we're going to start doing is including you on emails that come out that give you the opportunity to sign up for different weeks and different jobs at your convenience. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to help make church happen, but the really most important thing, uh, the reason I really push people to volunteer, is when you start volunteering volunteering at church, right? When you start volunteering at the gathering, that is when you make the leap from going to church and knowing people at church, right? That's when you make the leap between this is the church that I attend and this is the church where my friends are. Does that make sense? And so if you've ever been, wanted to be one of those people who, when you go to church, you know someone's waiting to see you there, right? When you have connections that you build over time where something starts to feel more like a family and a community rather than just a place you go to hear a sterling top tier A++ message <laughs> week after week after week, uh, right? We want church to transition to that. The number one way to do so is to start volunteering. And so just really want to push as we're, as we're getting into the fall season, uh, the gathering is going to blow up again. This is our not populated time of the year, right? 
Uh, and if you want to start helping make sure all these people uh, encounter a church that loves them uh, and makes the gospel known to them, this is a way for you to do it. Now, every time we gather together, uh, we pass the baskets, and two things go in the baskets. The first is our attendance cards, the ones that were in your seat when you sat down today. Whether this is your first time or your 100th time at the gathering, I ask that you make note that you joined us today. Uh, if you give us some more information, I'll include you on occasional emails and updates on things that are happening here. Uh, on the back, you've got an opportunity to indicate some things, like you're interested in joining the church or finding out what it means to become a Christian. You're interested in volunteering. Maybe you just want to have a cup of coffee with me and get a chance to know each other. I'd love for you to indicate any one of those things by checking off the mark on the back of your card, and please place it in the basket as it comes around. The second thing that goes in our baskets are our tithes and our offerings. Those are our financial gifts, our support to the ministry that this church makes possible. If you're a member of this church, uh, in the last week you received a giving statement. Uh, I received one at my house. That's just a statement of the giving that we've been doing. I want to thank all of you who've been so faithful and consistent with your giving and your supporting in the ministries. Uh, i got to tell you, at my house, we have a six-year-old son. And earlier in the year, he decided he wanted to do something to help homeless people. And so uh, he collected his money, and he put together, and he, uh, and he gave it to the mission, right? Because he wanted to help homeless people. Very sweet, something a lot of kids will do. What he didn't realize, that when he was doing that, that he got put into our donors database. And so yesterday, he re- or this week, he received his giving statement in the mail, <laughs> right? And it included a return envelope, <laughs> a chance for you to continue your giving and your faithful support. And he's really new to this game. So he was like, they sent a return envelope. I got to go fill it up. <laughs> so, so he went back and scoured his room and filled up his return envelope to continue supporting the missions of the church. If you raise your children upright, they will walk in the ways of the Lord. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you who continue your faithful giving, who model that behavior for your friends and your family, for people to learn, because together we are making possible the missions that God has given to this portion of the body of Christ, our church. So I ask you to continue uh, your faithful support of all of our ministries. Uh, now we begin every service with uh, words of invocation. If you would please stand and join me. I'm going to lead. The, I'm going to read the leader portion. You are all going to read uh, the people portion, the bold and italics. Come out of your busy lives to a quiet time and place. Our souls thirst for some peace and quiet. Come and rest in the Lord, who will restore your souls. Our lives need moments of rest. Come and find the quiet center. Come and be at peace. Praise God who offers to us a shelter and resting place. Amen. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. morning. My name is Savannah, and I'm so glad to be here at the gathering with you. Um, I don't know about you, but that was definitely speaking to me. (laughs) Everything's been, like, crazy. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The part about, about, like, needing a place of rest. Everything's been kind of hectic in this season for me. So if you're feeling the same way, then maybe that spoke to you, too. Um, We have a new song. It's called Gravity of Love. It's pretty easy to catch on to. Um, So here we go. I lift my eyes up to the hills. This my morning song, where my strength comes from. I lift my eyes up to the hills. This my evening song, where my help comes from. Let's sing that again. I lift my eyes up to the hills. This my morning song, where my strength comes from. I lift my eyes up to the hills. This my evening song, where my help comes comes from this is the gravity of love just as the moon follows the sun you're all around me you're holding everything this is the hope of every land just as the universe expands your love is reaching you're holding up to the hills when will our help come lord we cry how long we lift our eyes up to the hills even as we run hope is chasing us let's 
sing it again. We lift our eyes up to the hills. When will our help come? Lord, we cry, how long? We lift our eyes up to the hills. Just as the moon follows the sun, your love is reaching your love around me. This is the hope of every land. Just as the universe expands, your love is reaching. You're holding everything. So uh, I want to do something a little bit differently today than we normally do. I want to add a special moment. One of the things that I love to do in the gathering is highlight uh, the ministries that y'all do. Highlight when y'all answer the call, when y'all step up to serve. Uh, There's a lot of ministries that y'all are a part of that do so much to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ that aren't necessarily just through the church, right? And so I really love to support and encourage those things. And uh, one of the things that happened last week was we had a guest uh, leader and singer um, because Savannah was out of town. Uh, She was even out of the county. Uh, Where did you go, Savannah? I went to Rwanda, Africa, so it was a little bit of a drive. Yeah, it's (laughs) it's quite a drive. And uh, she spent a week doing something that she hadn't done before. She stepped out. Uh, she, she answered a call to be the hands and feet and to serve in a new way. And so I just wanted uh, Savannah to have the floor for a few minutes and share about what you did and what you saw and what it meant to you. Yeah, so um, I was in Rwanda. I was in Rwanda for um, helping out, actually documenting, video documenting, um, for a ministry called Zoe Ministry. And what they do is it's an orphan empowerment program, which... You may be like, when I first heard that, I was like, what does that even mean? That sounds cool, but what does that mean? Um, So it's it's amazing to see in person, kind of hard to explain in a few words, um, especially within like five minutes or so. So I'll do my best, um, but I'll also tell you where to go if you want to learn more. Um, So what Zoe does, Zoe is... um, across seven countries, if I'm correct in that right now. It's a three-year empowerment program. So what they do is um, most, they're in uh, countries where where poverty is really prevalent. Um, There's a lot of orphans. So like in Rwanda's case, um, when the program started, there were a lot of orphans uh, after the genocide. And um, so they, a lot of times kids were the head of household kids, you know, as young as 10 or 12, and really had no way besides begging to provide for themselves, and begging was not uh, getting what they needed. And so what Zoe does is a um, three-year program that teaches um, kids how to provide for themselves, so they'll, ha- they'll have a skill that, um, like, if, you know, we met some kids that sold, that grew bananas and sold bananas in markets. Um, Some make baskets, um, so they're able to provide for themselves and then teach others. So, and uh, so it's amazing to see the journey that they've gone through, and um, it's incredibly emotional too to hear just problems that we can't even imagine, like us or our kids or people we know having, and this is, you know, their lives that they've had to struggle through, um, and how proud they are to share now this journey that they've gone through. And so um, I have a few pictures from it. Um, so first of all, Rwanda is beautiful. It's not, 
it was 75 degrees there. And when I told my mom that, Lord she was have like, mercy. be quiet. <laughs> it was 75 so, here last week, too. You missed it. But oh, it was, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It was, gr- it was sure. gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's not at all what I thought. It totally, you know, because in my mind, I was thinking, like, African savanna, you know, lions and stuff. But <laughs> it's very green. It's very mountainous. And it's very beautiful. And the people there are just amazing. Um, and then the next picture... So this is, this is our team right here. Um, uh, we had a group of 14 people, but um, with me, it was a three person, including right myself, way. video team. Um, so three years ago, another video team people I work with went to talk to the, the um, kids who were just starting out in the program. Um, so we went back to follow up. So it was pretty amazing to see uh, just the results of you know their hard work and their empowerment and things that they did through their through their strength and um, so uh, I don't know, yeah, I'm kind of camouflaged there I'm in a hat and I look like I'm on a safari but <laughs> so uh, uh, this lady right here she's amazing her name's Epiphany she started the program she Zoe existed before her but she as someone who lives in Rwanda could see the pain that these kids were going through and knew more than anyone in America how that could be, you know, um, not fixed, but at least, like, to empower these kids and to carry on through generations. So she runs the program there in Rwanda. Um, So she was there as our translator and our guide, and um, the kids love her and everything. She's amazing. Um, So that's us. this, these guys right here on the right in the blue, that's Jean Marie. He makes beautiful woodwork and um, cards like out of little banana leaves that are, it's beautiful art. And uh, this is Erasme next to him. He's one of his students. And they, they both graduated like in 2012, I think, or they started in 2012 and they graduated 2015. Um, but they have, he has three stores. He teaches a school of, um, for other kids to learn how to do this. He's, and some of those kids have gone on to other countries like Uganda and stuff to do their own shops now. And so it's amazing. It's not just like these kids, it's, it spreads outward. And so it's amazing to see his success. He's putting his siblings through school. Um, he has a house and then, you know, so their dreams go from, I just want a meal to eat, you know, that that's where their dreams start. And now their dreams are something more like like he wants a motorcycle, you know, I can something relate. like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, Savannah. Yeah. So you, uh, you're talking, you're talking about all these wonderful things that Zoe is doing, but I want to ask about a question about you, uh-huh. and that is, all of us have these these ideas or these windows into like, man, these things are really special. They're happening across the world. They're happening in my community, but I'm too nervous to participate, mm-hmm. or this is too outside of my comfort zone, or I'm. I don't know where I would even begin, right? Did you have any of that apprehension before this? And if so, how'd you deal with it? So I did because um, I was asked as part of, you know, the video team to go. And I was, I had always known about Zoe and loved Zoe and I did some editing, but I was like, to actually go, I was like, this is gonna be incredibly emotional and I don't know if I'm ready for this. First of all, that's a long way away. And I just don't know if I can do that, so I, I tossed it around. That's actually east. Good job. I was like, what's your pointing? That, way. that is right. Yeah, good job. Well done. I appreciate details like that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, I decided I I was I thought I want to support this program, and uh, not that it requires you to go to Africa or any of the other countries, um, Rwanda or any of the other countries to support them, but. In this instance, I wanted to be able to tell the stories and bring them back here, and uh, that's what we were hoping to do. We didn't actually go and you know build houses or anything, which that blows a lot of people's minds. How are you helping if you're not doing something with your hands, you know? But we're going there to tell the stories back here, if that makes sense, to be able to support them because we want them to be self-sufficient. That's the idea. So yes, I did have those um, concerns, and but. You know, I I thought more so that I would regret not going. 
So there, in this room, there are a bunch of people who are interested in the idea of helping be a reading advocate or something, but they're just too nervous about doing it. Or there's people who are interested in, in dramatically changing their life to pursue something they think is worthy, but they're too scared of what, how it's going to impact things. As someone who took a big step and who went outside of their comfort zone, what would you to say to somebody who's feeling that tug but just isn't ready to respond yet? Hmm. I would say there's always a place for you to help in whatever capacity that doesn't it might mean going to Africa. It might mean, you know, um, telling others. It might be being a reading partner. It might be um, giving money. It might be all of the above. Um, but I would say don't exclude yourself just because you have you feel limitations in one capacity. Um, be, be willing to stretch a little bit, but also you already, there is something for you, you know. There, you have the ability to give and give big. You may just be one person, but one person, as I've seen over there, can make a huge difference. Well, on behalf of the entire church, thank you for your willingness to serve and thank step you. outside of your comfort zone and for sharing with us. I appreciate it. And if, if you want to learn more, too, um, hopefully I can bring a video once we finish editing. You can go to uh, wearezoe.org, Z-O-E, and there's a lot of info there. And if you ever ask you one of us, we'll make sure to connect you. Thank you so much, Savannah. Uh, one of the things that we do every time we come together is pray to God together, speak to God together knowing that God is listening, listening to God together knowing that God speaks. Uh, I'll lead us in a prayer of confession, then we'll have the call and response, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll all say together, hear our prayers. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We'll then do a Trinitarian prayer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then uh, I'll lift up some names that people we're praying for, and then I'll say, are there any others? And it's your chance to say out loud, lift up the names of people uh, that you want to lift up in prayer this morning. So together, as God's holy church, let us pray. Patient God, we wait all year for the summer months when we can rest and relax. Our schedules change from the demands of weekly living to times which are supposed to be devoted to leisure. But we have redefined leisure to mean a flurry of activities. We need some time to rest, to sit quietly and listen to the beautiful sounds of the world. Forgive us when we are determined to crowd every moment of our lives with activity. Help us to find a quiet center with you where we can just relax and not try to get everything done as though life was some sort of a contest. Give us peace for a little while. Refresh our souls so that we can truly serve you, not out of exhaustion, but out of enthusiasm. Be with us this day, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father God, you are the creator of all things, everything, and everything you create, you proclaim to be good. Evidence of that goodness continues to show itself all around us, new hopes, new lives, new mission trips, new friends, new opportunities. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, everything that you create, you make to be free. And that freedom over and over again is used for purposes of sin, for separation from you, for alienation, for causing pain, for hatred. Remind us, O oh God, that when we were at our worst, you did not give up on us or turn away from us. Instead, you joined us, came alongside each and every one of us through the power and presence of your Son, Jesus Christ. And through his life, death, and resurrection, you reconcile us back to you for once and for always. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Always and everywhere, O oh God, we are never alone. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, you walk alongside us, guide us, pervade us, shine light onto our path, fill us with hope and assurance of your grace and salvation. For this presence and encouragement, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Pat, Lord, in your mercy. For Sabrina, Lord, in your mercy. For Aaron, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For those names spoken out loud and those kept in the silence of our hearts, O oh God, hear our prayers. For every person looking for the strength to face another difficult day, hear our prayers. Free to those searching to rebuild their lives, to reclaim the possibility of hope, and for searching for life anew, hear our prayers. 
and for each and every person changing their hearts and lives, seeking out you through your son, Jesus. Hear our prayers. Guide us, keep us, make us into your people. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Amen. Everyone, I'm so thankful that you're here with us today. My name is Lance again. This is The Gathering. Uh, One of the things The Gathering does is focus on specific topics of conversation for a number of weeks at a time. Always wanting to give you the chance to dig in a little bit deeper, look at things from a couple different angles. Uh, Over the summer, over this month of July, we're doing a sermon series called My Bible. And uh, My Bible is just a series that's, that's focused on helping you kind of break down some of the barriers for biblical engagement. The Gathering is very effective at primarily reaching people who are coming from two backgrounds. One, who people who've never really been super involved in a church or a faith community or Christian faith at all, or to people who are returning, right? People who are returning after usually a long absence or, or maybe are responding for the first time with real enthusiasm and vigor for the first time in their life. These are the primary people that are engaging with faith through the gathering. And so one of the things I'm always trying to do is help you uh, become more familiar and more acquainted with the basic tenets of the faith, right? What is grace? What does, is, who is Christ? What does salvation mean, right? How are we to respond? What is this supposed to be? And included in that are helping you kind of learn all the different dance steps and all the different things that become a part of it. And so we talk a lot about the sacraments, communion, and baptism. Uh, we talk a lot about faithful response. We do a lot of teaching on the very structures of the church, right? The holidays, the way that we uh, go through the calendar with the church, and things like our holy scriptures, right? So we talk a lot about the Bible and specifically trying to do my best to help you kind of come to understand the Bible, right? Become more comfortable reading it for yourself, engaging it with your, for yourself, uh, learning how to use it in your family, in group, in reflection, uh, giving you the tools to read and to encounter and to question these texts, right? All for the purposes of a growing and thriving relationship with God in your own life. And one of the most effective ways we can do that is step beyond just the idea of the, the Bible being something that's out there and abstract, or the Bible being something that's even just trapped in different apps in our phones, and the Bible becoming something physical and tangible uh, that is a part of your life, your rhythm, your interaction. Uh, we've shared over the course of a number of different weeks all of the ways in which uh, this can play out. I shared, you know, despite being having a number of different copies of the Bible and different resources for different means, uh, a couple of years ago I started using this one physical printed Bible as my primary uh, Bible. It's the one that I read the most, it's the one that I study the most, it's the one that I preach the most from the most, and, uh, and it, just throughout I have sticky notes, and I have highlights, and I have underlines, and I have thoughts, and over and over again, those sticky notes, y'all, have like no special insights in them at all. And those notes in the margin are like not special or useful or insightful at all. It's just the testimony of my own journey, my own responses. And over time, the more that I've become to engage uh, personally with copies of the Bible, the, own, the more my own kind of uh, spiritual growth and familiarity uh, has expanded. So that's what we're talking about over the course of this series. Uh, I've never really understood why the person in this stock image left their Bible in the leaves. <laughs> but if that helps you, feel free, <laughs> right? If that helps you uh, just to leave it in the yard in the fall, then I guess so be it. One of the ways... Uh, that I'm, I'm talking about framing our engagement with the Bible uh, to help us kind of uh, look at it a different way um, and respond to it, engage with it a little bit more personally is through the very act of the idea of a table of contents, right? If you have your physical Bible with you today, if you'd please turn uh, to the table of contents. Every Bible has a table of contents in the very front of the book. It's going to be exactly where you expect to find it. Uh, Your table of contents is located right there. Uh, 99% of the table of contents are laid out in the same way. It's going to have the Old Testament books in their order and then the New Testament books in their order. And table of contents are incredibly useful for helping us find what we're looking for, but there's a problem. 99% of the time when people are engaging with the Bible for the first time in their lives, right, they're taking first steps, uh, they're they're looking for something, right? They're, They're seeking something. They're trying to find something, right? And usually what they're trying to find, what they're seeking, what they're looking for is some sort of a word into their life, right? Uh, they, have, they have an issue they're trying to deal with. They have a need for wisdom they're trying to encounter. They're looking for some direction. They're looking for some hope. They're looking for some encouragement. Who knows, right? The reasons people go to the Bible are myriad, but very few people turn to the Bible for the very first time in their life and say, I just want to know what page Nehemiah starts on. Because if that's you, the table of contents has got you covered, 
right? But the table of contents is for finding what we need, and it's usually organized uh, by the, the, the order of the books and not by what we're actually looking for. And so one of the things I'm asking you to do is to make notes on the table of contents of your Bible, right? And if you've got one of the pew Bibles with you, write them on the table of contents of that one, because it's going to help the person who comes behind you uh, with the very same thing. And so one of the things that we've done over the course of the last few weeks is add to the table of contents in our Bible. In week one, I had you make note of a prayer for tough times. At the very top of the page on your table of contents, make note, a prayer for tough times. And then you wrote next to that Psalm 86, 1 through 7. A, a, a prayer uh, that the psalmist writes that helps you give you know, words to what it is that you're feeling. Helps guide you and teach you. How, how do you pray to God when you are really at the end of your rope? Right? How do you speak to God when you're really feeling empty and desperate? right? If you, if you desire to have that kind of relationship and communication, but you just don't have the words, right? The psalmist is here to help you. Under that, I ask you to write words of encouragement and direction. So many times we're facing these situations where we just don't know what to prioritize. We have these choices to make, right? Do we go this way or that way? Do we pursue this relationship, that opportunity, right? This career, that direction, right? So many times things are feeling tossed up in the air. Things are feeling uncertain. Where do I go, right? And what at the end of the day is the, is the motivating hope and encouragement to guide me there? I ask you to make note of Philippians 4, 4 through 9, a letter from the Apostle Paul to an early church that's facing, though in their own time and place, the same kind of things that you're going to face, right? Insecurity, uncertainty, lack of direction, right? He's giving you those words of encouragement. Last week, uh, we cut through all the chatter, right? And sometimes uh, it's really encouraging to remember that the whole thing, the whole thing this faith thing is actually about, the whole thing this Christianity thing is actually about is knowing and following Jesus Christ, Right? At the end of the day, that's what this is all about, knowing and following Jesus Christ. And so while the Bible is useful and it's wonderful, it's 66 different books, and Jesus Christ is not speaking directly in the vast majority of them. So sometimes you need to just hear the man speak for himself. Right? This is all about Jesus at the end, and what you, do, what you need to know is where to turn to hear the man speaking directly to you. Jesus' best sermon is Matthew 5 through 7. It's three chapters. It's really only three pages. Right? But Matthew 5 through 7, I need you to have those notes on the top of your Bible. Where do I turn when I am really looking for something that will help me better understand who Jesus is and who he would have me be? All right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospel texts filled with Jesus' writing, writings and teachings. But if someone comes to me ever and says, I'm new to this and I want to start now, where do I go? I always send them to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' best sermon. Right? It's Jesus' longest unbroken form of teaching. But if I wrote Jesus' longest sermon, y'all wouldn't look at it. <laughs> Best sermon. Best sermon, right? So one of the things I want to add is something that is uh, extremely common, what people are looking for in the Bible. Right? So often you discover that what people are looking for uh, in the Bible is just some direction, right? uh, just some guidance right? They're looking for something just to help point them in the right direction, right? And that can get really difficult because the Bible is a whole bunch of different kinds of writing, right? It's a lot of stories. It's a lot of uh, ancient texts. It's a lot of poetry. It's all these different kinds of writing. And sometimes what we're just looking for is direction, right? And a whole bunch of people uh, feel like they're not accessing that in the Bible, and so they start looking for it in other places. If you look on social media long enough, if you look at the things that we, we share as our best quotes or our things that really influence us, you will see that there is a deep desire in our culture for what I will call ancient wisdom, right? There is a deep desire in our culture for ancient wisdom, right? For guidance, for instruction that has passed the test of time. Uh, and it pervades us and it guides us. It's extremely, it's popular on everything from t-shirts to our bumper stickers to our social media profiles, right? To our hipster tattoos in our 20s. Ancient wisdom is incredibly meaningful and valuable. And so I shared some examples of ancient wisdom uh, that I could find. It does not matter how slowly you go, so long as you do not stop, right? Everything has its beauty, but not everyone sees it. I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, but I do and I understand, right? Anyone know who this comes from? Next, the sli next slide. It comes from Confucius, right? 2,500-year-old writings, right? These things that pass the test of time are rich and, and full of guidance. They're incredibly popular. Uh, next example. The unexamined life is not worth living. Beware of the barrenness of a busy life, right? These, these wise statements. My favorite one. By all means, marry. If you get a good spouse, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> right? Ancient wisdom, right? Wisdom that has passed the test of time. Right? And if I just told you this came from someone in the last 20 years, it wouldn't have the same gravity as hearing that it came from Socrates. 
right? 2,500 years ago again, right? Wisdom that has passed the test of time, that has uh, defined the ages over and over and over again that you can apply to your own life, right? We're always looking for wisdom that's rich and full. <laughs> See, right? Uh, this is, you can, you, can already, you can already tell. People have identified themselves around the room, right? Uh, go ahead, Allie. Uh, from, we want wisdom from a long, long time ago. <laughs> right? We're looking for sources of ancient wisdom, right? Ancient wisdom and guidance. We're looking to uh, root ourselves into something greater or bigger. There are two phases that every young man goes through, right? There are two phases. The first phase is convincing yourself somewhere between eighth and 10th grade that Led Zeppelin is the only band worth listening to. We all go through that phase, the second phase is reading The Art of War and trying to apply it to every aspect of your life, right? These are two universal male traveling points that we all encounter, right? One of the things that I need you to understand is that one of the greatest and most foundational sources of ancient wisdom in the entire Western world, right, our entire uh, literary and philosophical and cultural tradition is the Bible itself, right? The Bible is the world's greatest repository for ancient wisdom on how to live. And so the next thing that I need you to write right now on your table of contents, something that you can share in your own life, that you can review, that you can encounter with your family and with your kids, ancient wisdom for wealth and happiness. Ancient wisdom through the ages for wealth and happiness, right? Passed on from generation to generation, found to be wise and true. And that's going to be located in the book of Proverbs. And it's going to be in chapters 10 through 29. That sounds really long, right? T chapters 10 through 29. It's about 15 pages in your Bible, right? One of the things I need you to understand is that one of the greatest repositories for those little bits of direction that you're looking for, right, those little bitty points of encouragement, uh, the what next, the what nows, the Bible is actually one of the greatest repositories for that guidance uh, that you have in your life, and it's been sitting on your shelf all this time. If you would turn with me, please, uh, to the book of Proverbs. We're going to go in Proverbs 1, right? Proverbs is easy to find. If you open your Bible, one, you're in the table of contents, so it should be really easy to find. Uh, two... Proverbs, uh, if you open your Bible right up to the middle, it's going to open up the Psalms. Uh, Proverbs comes right after the Psalms. So uh, the Proverbs are what's called wisdom literature. There's three books of wisdom literature in the Hebrew Bible, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Uh, these are books of reflection, right? These are books of a life well-lived in deep connection with God and reflecting on what is worthwhile, what is good, what is true. The book of Proverbs was collected during the time of exile when the people of Israel were having to train up their young men on what it is to be faithful and good in the midst of having to live in a foreign country other, under foreign impress, oppressors. So it's written with that male audience in mind, but if you just change the gender specifics of the Proverbs, it applies to all people, all backgrounds. It specifically applies to today just as much as it did 2,500 years ago because it is timeless, ancient wisdom. The writer of Proverbs begins in chapter 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, King David's son from Israel. Their purpose is to teach wisdom and discipline, to help one understand wise sayings. They provide insightful instruction, which is righteous, just, and full of integrity. They make the naive mature, the young knowledgeable and discreet. The wise hear them and grow in wisdom. Those with understanding gain guidance. They help one understand proverbs and difficult sayings, the words of the wise and their puzzles. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. When they say fear of the Lord, they mean awe of the Lord, deep and abiding respect of the Lord. That's where wisdom begins. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. The purpose of these proverbs is to help you become the kind of person right? Who lives wisely. The purpose of the Proverbs is to shape you, to mold you, to guide you, to guide your children, to influence your values, to give you direction, right? If you've ever wished that you could just open the Bible and find some actionable and discreet steps on what do I do now, Proverbs is exactly what you are looking for. And here's the fascinating thing about Proverbs, right? There's hundreds of them, right? There's 15 pages. Most of them are just a line of two. There's hundreds of these different Proverbs. And the way that you read Proverbs is just to let them wash over you, 
right? You read over the Proverbs. You digest them uh, tons at a time. And what you'll realize is when you read Proverbs, at different points in your life, different things will begin to jump out at you, right? When you read Proverbs at different points, based on what you're experiencing and what you're seeking and what you're looking for and what you're encountering of God and of the rest of the world today, different portions of the Proverbs will speak to you. So what I did this week was read through the Proverbs again and see what sticks out at me this week, right? What directs me this week? What are my favorite Proverbs today? What are my favorite Proverbs today? So when I'm reading through Proverbs this week, these are the things that are sticking out to me. When pride comes, so does shame, but wisdom brings humility, right? And I think of all of the times in my own life and the lives of people that I love and I care for when I was acting most out of control under the ego monster, you know what I'm talking about? When your ego monster is the most out of control or my friend's ego monster was the most out of control, what was really going on under the surface was the deep and abiding fear of what's wrong with me, right? What's wrong with me? What's broken in me? The people that I know or the times in my own life where we've been most under control of the ego monster, what's really happening is the deep question, is there something wrong with me? Am I not actually worthy? Am I not actually worthwhile? And to help appease that pain, what we're doing is just proclaiming our own greatness and our own superiority over and over and over again. And this proverbial writer points out that wisdom, right, right relationship with God, right, right understanding of who you are, brings humility. It's when coming to understand that your worth is not tied into how you perform or what you've achieved or what you've earned or how good you look or how many likes you get on your posts, right? When who you are and the root of your understanding comes and they acknowledge that you are, you are unique and loved because because you are a child of God, but that's exactly the same thing as everybody else. What comes from that is this real and abiding humility, right? The very opposite of that pride and ego monster. That was sticking out to me. Another thing that was sticking out to me was this next proverb. Walk with wise people and become wise. Befriend fools and get in trouble, right? And two of my best friends have joined us uh, for worship today, and we need to just pray for them. Right? No, what I've discovered in my, you know, we were recently at a, uh, uh, a mission trip in Albuquerque, and at the, the, um, the church that we were staying at, they had over their youth activity center, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Right? Isn't that a good word for teenagers? Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Right? But let me hear this. That advice does not stop when we finish high school. Right? That advice does not stop when we get done with college or whatever else we choose to do right? right. You are continued to be shaped today by the people that you spend time with, right? By the people that you give access into your life. And by the way, that's not just physical people. That's also what you watch. That's also what you consume, right? That's also what you study, right? How many of us will so quickly say to a kid, like, look, violent video games, all that stuff is awful. Put that away. Go spend time with your friends. I am now going to go watch a murder show. (laughs) I got these crimes to solve, (laughs) right? How many people bemoan the fact that we don't just listen to each other anymore and that we don't hear each other anymore and that we don't agree to disagree anymore and then we go watch a yelling politics show? Oh, he's gone from preaching to meddling now. (laughs) Next one. You're shaped by the people you spend time with. Pleasant words are flowing honey, sweet to the taste and healing to the bones, right? So often we say, don't say mean stuff, right? So often we say to our kids, to our spouses, to our, don't say rough stuff, right? Don't hurt people with your words, right? How often do we say to people, your words can heal? How often do we say to people, your sweet words can be like honey to somebody who is struggling? Do you realize that about yourself, right? Your words can heal. And I'm embarrassed to admit this. I hope you guys don't think this is pathetic. Uh, but if you ever send me a note, right, or a card, or something that's sweet or nice, I don't throw it away, right? I keep it. If you send me an email, I print it out, (laughs) and I put it in here, right? If you ever send me a note, or a congratulations, or some word of encouragement, or thanks, or gratitude, or appreciation, if I've ever, and there's a lot of these, not because I'm special, I'm a lot of these because y'all are very nice, right? If someone ever says something like that to me, or writes it down, I keep it, right? And you know when I pull it out, right? You know when I go back and I read it. You know when I go back to that folder to hear the words that are healing, right? And it's when, it's when the bones are hurting. 
It's when my bones are hurting. It's when I'm in desperate need of something to give me energy and encouragement. And do you realize that your words can do that? That's what's sticking out to me today. This ancient wisdom, right? Uh, the last one is by far the most important. If there's one thing that you walk out of here today, I need you to do so by having, I don't know if y'all are good at memorizing scripture. If you, if you never memorized scripture before, this is a really good one to start with, right? <laughs> I've been preaching every week for five years, and I've been waiting. When does Proverbs 26.11 come in? <laughs> when does it come in? Have truer words ever been written? <laughs> For those of you listening to the podcast, the scripture is, like a dog that returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats foolish mistakes. No explanation necessary. Sometimes it just speaks for itself. Your Bible, right? Your Bible has so much for you, right? Your Bible has what you're looking for. Your Bible has words of wisdom and guidance. It gives you language for prayer in the deepest and hardest of times. It gives you direction for how to live the kind of life that you're trying to live that is not only direct, that is not only applicable, but has been found true and reasonable and powerful and good for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations. And most importantly, it gives you direct access, a chance to touch and taste and see and know for your Yourself, the most important thing that's ever happened on the face of the planet Earth, and that is the good news of God's redemption and love and reconciliation and grace given to you by the teachings, the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible has that for you. It has that for you. It is waiting for you. Be blessed by it over and over and over again. Let us pray. Great and loving God, these writers give to us today words that make us laugh, words that make us think, and words that make us look at ourselves and realize how are we living up, how are we shaping up. Remind us, O oh God, that whenever we look at something that encourages us to try something new, whenever we read something that points out ways in which we're falling short, everything happens through the lens of your grace. Everything happens through your presence and power. Everything happens through your words of assurance that when we receive your son, Jesus the Christ, that you know us, that you forgive us, and that you empower us for a life of faithful living being made more and more into his image every single day. God, as we go on a journey with these holy scriptures, remind us that they point us to you. And that is what life is all about. Guide us and keep us, and help us walk in the steps of your son, Jesus, as together we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite our communion stewards to come forward and assist with the serving of communion today, it's a reminder that the words that we just said right there, they come to us from Jesus in the Bible, right? The disciples ask him how to pray, and he says, pray like this, and that's the Lord's Prayer, and that's how we pray together. And we also reenact every week. We also come back to the table. We re-experience the moment every single week of what he later told us to do. In our very same Bibles, right? On the day that he was to give himself up for us, on the day that he was to experience the pain and the torture of uh, the crucifixion, he looked out over his disciples, his followers, and knowing what they were going to experience, and then looking past them for hundreds and thousands of years to us, and knowing what we would experience, knowing what we would face, knowing the desperate need to encounter him, to believe him, to trust him, he took an ordinary piece of bread, broke it, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal was over, 
He took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it. And knowing the assurance that they would need, knowing the direction that they would need, knowing the promises they would need to actually encounter in order to change their hearts and lives, he took the wine, he said, take and eat. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we drink it often in remembrance of not only the teachings, not only the guidance, the guidance, not only the words of assurance, but the spirit of the very living God available to us each and every day. We always receive communion by coming down the center aisle with our hands held open. Uh, a piece of bread will be torn off the loaf and placed in your hand. Uh, you can dip it into the cup, return down the outside aisle, and uh, eat it and return to your seat for a time of uh, silent prayer for singing along with Savannah. We always celebrate communion with non-alcoholic grape juice because we don't want anyone to ever have to choose between sobriety and the sacrament. For people with a wheat sensitivity, we'll have a gluten-free station on the very far end. The, this is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is not the gatherings table. This is Christ's table. And like Christ's love, like Christ's grace, like Christ's redemption, like Christ's promise of life eternal, it is for everyone, all backgrounds, all ages, all understandings. It is for you today. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward and be fed. to hold us now. Speak to the storm and the waves die down. We were lost in the water. You speak to our hearts when we breathe, we admit we need Speak to the storm and the waves die down. We were lost in the water. You speak to our hearts when we breathe, we admit we need you. from the one we love we are 
As we come to the end of our time of worship together today, just a reminder, we have another worship service coming in uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, all the, the uh, attendance cards and the pens and stuff we can leave in the chairs, but any uh, cups of coffee, anything else, any Bibles, if we can please make sure those are picked up and taken to the rear of the room. Now, please bow your heads and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And may the ancient words of wisdom guide you now and every day of your life. Amen. Go in peace.